displacement has been a subject that's been uh, near and dear to my heart. We had our first uh, green building seminar over 10 years ago. So um, a couple of things, a couple of thoughts uh, before we get started. Well, actually, let's get started. I'll go over the agenda and then make my comments. Uh, so what we're going to do today, um, one of the things that I've done not so hot over the past 10 years in, in trying to educate the market on displacement is I may refer to certain concepts without having explained them fully. So I'm going to take a little bit of time to talk about like why displacement works well and to change some of the mindsets behind like, well, this is not just straight air distribution. It's a little bit different. So once we go through that, then we're going to talk about the displacement math, which if you look at the math, it can be a little bit daunting, but we're going to make easy the part of the math that um, you're going to need to use. And then finally, um, can we can we make it work in the spaces and can we afford it and will it be an improvement? So with that, let's get going. Um, this is a little bit of a salute um, to um, the first my first teacher on displacement ventilation. Jerry's no um, was no dumb guy is a PhD in human physiology. And what was always great about Jerry is he never really talked, you know, Price is a, a big manufacturer. They don't really care on one hand or the other whether you use uh, air distribution mixing or displacement or VAV or chilled beams, they make it all. But what I really liked about Jerry's approach was it was always very conceptual. And so I'm gonna share some of the concepts that uh, he developed over the years and trying to relate it, uh, relate displacement ventilation to the average bear. Jerry passed away a few years ago. I do miss working with him. He was just a great guy. He was, when uh, I worked on the CRC conference a handful of years ago, um, Jerry came in and was a guest lecturer for us. So. All right, so with that, concept number one, the kiddie pool. So, um, when we do air distribution in a mixing system, just imagine slot diffusers, for example. Well, we know that air behaves differently when we're throwing across the room in heating mode or in cooling mode, for sure. But when we're doing displacement ventilation, we don't really need to think about throw in that way. And I want you instead to think of the displacement air because it's cooling more like a fluid. So, when we're thinking about it as a fluid, like the person holding the hose, and if we're filling up a flat kiddie pool, does it necessarily matter where we hold the hose? Because we get hung up a lot on, um, well, how far apart can we, but if we can meet the load in space, it doesn't really matter where the introduced air comes from as long as we match the load. And here's a little video to help with that concept. And here we go. The corner-mounted round displacement diffuser, or the DR90, is designed specifically for a corner application. Here the airflow generated by the DR90 resembles a waterfall, as the cooler supply air pours into the room and falls to cover the floor in a 90 degree pattern. For this smoke test, a face velocity of 40 feet per minute was used to demonstrate a typical office installation. Notice how the air completely fills the room moving around obstacles and reaching every corner of the space. Here, even with a large desk directly in its path, the air being supplied by the DR90 flows around the obstruction to cover the entire floor of the room. Now, a couple thoughts about 40 feet per minute and how this air moves. Number one is, this is not slow-mo. That's what 40 feet per minute looks at real speed. It does seem like it's slow-mo, if you wanted to create Re recreate Michael Jackson's thriller, you'd probably use something like this. So that's number one. And 40 feet per minute, just, just to conceptualize it, imagine walking 40 feet in one minute and how slow you'd actually have to move yourself uh, to make, you know, to resemble that the speed of the air. So, and if we compare it to what wind speed would be like, it would be less than a half a mile of wind speed, which would be considered completely calm. All right, so moving on through that concept, oops, okay. So we've had this experience before where we go outside on a winter day and have two completely different experiences. 
One is at the same temperature and it's perfectly calm. And on another day where there's a 10 mile an hour wind and the difference in how you have to dress to be comfortable and why that is. Well, the effect of temperature is really small when you consider that we have a thermal plume that sort of creates this boundary layer around us and protects us and gives us kind of an ideal body temperature. So I've got another video next to show you that articulates this concept about thermal plumes. And to skip ahead a little bit. Other possible heat sources include monitors, lights, motors, machinery, or any object within the occupied space which has the ability to warm the supply air. After the air has been drawn up into the occupied zone, the used or polluted air is exhausted through the high-level returns. Now, if we take just a snapshot, oops, I did not mean to This do next that series one. of shots to warm polluted air is exhausted. Okay, if we take this snapshot, sorry about that. Um, you can easily see how this is a, basically a single pass system. The cool air rises from the floor at heat sources, passes past the heated objects once, and collects in the, in the um, unoccupied zone above the ceiling to be returned back to the air handler. So I've made the analogy before, which maybe I should have included it in one of them. It's sort of like taking a shower upside down. The clean air from the shower comes from below, and the dirty air ends up in the drain, which would be above. Uh, we made a little video about that a couple of years ago. It's on our website. It's kind of cool. So again, you can see um, it's sort of got, in addition to comfort, it's got a little bit of baked in safety in that it's a single pass system. All right, and moving on. Can you extinguish a flame by inhaling? And I don't know if any of you have ever tried it, but it's not possible. And so we see applications regularly, and many of you have designed them in the past where you feel like there's an opportunity to control the path of the air by placing the return somewhere. We see a lot of gyms, for example, that have returns down low and diffusers up high with the idea that we'll put the ventilation air up here and then, oh, the return is going to pull it all down. Well, if you consider how that, you know, sucking out a match is not possible. How much are you going to impact the flow of air in a space with a return location. It just doesn't actually do anything. Buoyancy is much more powerful than the, replace, than the placement of the return. So another kind of concept for you to consider as we're um, looking at designs. All right, this next concept um, has to do with the theory of the, what is it, the solution to the problem of pollution is dilution. So we've all experienced this we get up on a beautiful, shiny, um, sun shining on a Sunday morning. Oh man, maybe the kids are still asleep and we see the dust particles in the air. Now, if we are gonna try to control the dust particles in the air, what ASHRAE's recommended is higher air change rates, number one, and number two is more outside air. So let's say we took a big leap with the system and put 10% outside air additional, and then we increase the ventilation rate in the room would we make a significant difference in how these dust particles appeared? Because we kind of think that individual particles are moving around, but at the end of the day, it's just this big swirled um, application and adding a little bit more outside air and moving this air around, it's still gonna look the same. The particle distribution in a mixing system is always gonna look the same. And to expand on that concept, um, I want to use uh, smoking as, as an example. So smoke particles, if you go online and research smoke particles, you can find them all the way down to 0.1 microns and up to 5 microns. You can find the SARS-CoV-2 particles, which is the, the, um, um, the virus that causes COVID-19 in a range from 0.1 to 1.4. ASHRAE says 0.6 to 1.4, but it's all sort of immaterial. When those particles are up in the air and with a mixing system, they're gonna distribute uniformly. So what we have next is an application, it's a really interesting application that's a little bit old, 
So this is a large indoor facility that allowed smoking. And I need to kind of walk through this with you a little bit slowly, so we'll take our time. And the next slide is blown up a little bit better, so it's easier to see. In 2005, this facility was using four CFM per square foot for its ventilation rate due to the smoking. And um, obviously, when you walked in the facility, you could see a cloud of smoke everywhere you looked. So one of the things that they did was they put in a dynamic air cleaning system on their return path, which had some pretty important effects. So if you look over, let's just pick this first corner to work from. So we've got um, particle size of a half a micron, 0.7 microns, and one microns, and up to five. Okay, and I don't know if you can even see my mouse, but that's what I'm pointing at. So when the owner added the dynamic air cleaning, there was a significant reduction in the particle counts of half micron in the breathing zone. And over the years, they tested in the same locations. Now, some of the test results are very goofy, but I highlighted the ones that, are kind of, that are, seem to be very important. So after dynamic air cleaning, uh, what happened is the round, uh, like gymnasium, these big round diffusers that you can spin around, they were replaced with DR360s, which is just a round placement diffuser, mounted anywhere from 12 to 17 feet over the floor. Now look at the difference in particles in the breathing zone at a half micron, at 0.7 microns, not much difference at one micron, and uh, I can't see because my, yeah. And then some, some appreciable difference at um, five microns. We had different results in different areas. Um, for example, in this area, after dynamic particle counting, or I'm sorry, after dynamic air cleaning, the particle count went up. Well, something must have happened in the zone. So I can't really confirm or deny what happened there. But in the grand, and let me just switch this next slide because it's a little bit easier to see. In the grand scheme of things, there was a significant reduction of particles at various sizes due to the change of displacement. Now this was hardly a, you know, ideal displacement de design. Wherever the diffusers were, they took the diffuser out and the same size, same airflow diffuser was placed in. Much later, um, this same facility went through another retrofit where the airflow was cut in half and the results, I don't know if they did retesting, but. Certainly by um, my estimation uh, and experience with displacement, I'm sure that the particle counts went even further by reducing the airflow. So, interesting, does it have a significant effect? Yes. Let's also keep in mind that if we weren't doing a good job of dropping the particle counts at the, um, at the air handler, the result by displacement would be insignificant because you know with with the small particle size of covid if we um don't get it out well we're just pushing dirty air and the particles back into the space so it's a combination the filtration has to be present and the dv can make a significant difference all right so that's the end of concept three uh i'm sorry that was four and now five a word about comfort and i'll i will say this we used mixing ventilation is maybe the gold standard. And it is hardly a gold standard. My office right now is pretty uncomfortable. Why? Well, if I turn my computer around, I have two big windows, which is nice, I have a nice view, but we need a lot of air to make this room comfortable. And it is often drafty, and it's drafty right now. And we just, you know, human uh, physiology, we kind of, we walk into a room, we notice it's not that comfortable, and then we forget about it. We move on to other things. Displacement is almost always comfortable. And there's a strange reason for it, which we're going to articulate shortly. But just remember, you know, this is a fun example. No politics in mind. But if we can keep any two people comfortable in the same space, uh, our president and first lady would be a great example. So Donald obviously weighs a little bit more than the first lady. Their metabolism rates are different. They wear different clothes. She's got open ankles. He's got pants and probably socks that go up to his knees. And so how is it possible that the two of them can be comfortable in the same space? And with a mixing ventilation, they cannot. 
it's just about impossible. So this next little video that I'll show you is a, probably my biggest failing in, in teaching displacement ventilation. I was never really good about articulating this point. The video on the other end does a great job of it. So here goes. This smoke test demonstrates the thermal plume, which is the effect of heat sources warming the surrounding air and causing it to rise. Possible heat sources include occupants, computers, monitors, lights, electronics, or any object within the occupied space that can warm the supply air. When fresh air, supplied through price displacement ventilation diffusers, encounters a heat source, it is warmed and drawn up delivering fresh air to the occupied zone. After the air has been drawn up into the occupied zone, the used or polluted air is exhausted through high-level returns. This scenario demonstrates what happens to the supply air as it encounters heat sources with different loads. Each heat source will receive supply air that corresponds to their heat output. Higher heat sources receive more supply air while lower heat sources receive less supply air, thereby maintaining excellent occupant comfort. In overhead mixing systems, supply air is delivered to the space from above and is fully mixed throughout the occupied space in order to dilute any contaminants throughout the occupied space. In displacement ventilation, cool, fresh supply air is continuously delivered to the occupied zone from below, while the polluted air is forced up and out of the occupied zone. This approach is what makes displacement ventilation a clean and comfortable method to ventilate a space. And thanks to Price for putting that video together. Uh, it's that, that video is specific to this class, so really nice that they did that for us. I think it was, I think that, um, is a hard concept to, to deliver without showing how it actually works. So uh, we're moving into the more of the nuts and the bolts of how to do it. So hopefully you can kind of take these concepts with you along the ride. So um, if you have a copy of the engineer's handbook, great. Um, there's a whole section on the how and why of displacement. If you like reading about it, I think the smoke videos do a pretty good job of articulating uh, how it works, but it's all in the book. So um, this is a piece of software that we're gonna refer to called Price Room Designer. I don't really use the, there's a function where you can place diffusers on a plan. I don't really feel the need to do that because again, does it matter where you hold the hose uh, example? But that tool is available, but um, we'll get into the other use of that tool in a second. So uh, now we're into the calculations and oh, does this look like something we want to tackle by hand. No, it really doesn't, but if we take a close look at it, uh, it really turns out not to be that bad. So here's the elements of that, that equation for displacement. QDV on the left is the flow of displacement air. Um, there's an adjustment factor over here for the load of occupants and equipment of the lights and of the uh, exterior zone. And then there's some correction factors that have to do with density and something called delta T, the temperature rise from your head to your foot. And I don't spend a lot of time talking about delta T HF, but one thing to think about is we're not using 55 degrees. So we're looking at a, an application that looks like the picture that was on your invitation. It's, and like your smoke video, cool air, not cold, cool air introduced in the space and we're lifting the contaminants out to a high return to be processed by the air handler. What does that really look like when it comes to loads? It looks more like this. So we're gonna process in the occupied zone only 29% of the load by people and by equipment. And the lights is almost gonna be entirely displaced to the unoccupied zone. The lights tend to be in the unoccupied zone. So all that radiant heat stays up at the top and just what very little heat drops into the occupied zone. And finally, the exterior load is generally displaced up into the bottom above. 
do we get rid of the load? No, we have to manage the load um, so it doesn't disappear. But this is a good way to kind of think about it. Now, if you glance at this, you'd say, well, an air handler and a displacement system should be about, I don't know, 25% of the full airflow. But if we use 62 degrees as, as an example, instead of 55, 62 to 72, we have half the capacity of what normally we'd be from 55 to um, 72 or 75. So sometimes airflow is higher with displacement, oddly, and sometimes it's lower. And we have to look at each load characteristic to determine it. So back to this whole, does it matter where you hold the hose? One of the things we'll use in this design example we're going to share is you can hold, you can have this, these displacement diffusers in their traditional low um, mounting place, but you can also, if you can't handle the floor space or the ducting costs too much to bring it to the floor, the diffusers can be suspended above. We've put diffusers up 17, 20 feet up in the air. They work just fine. As long as we know it in advance, we can take that into consideration for design. So again, does it matter where you hold the hose? It does not. So let's think about air handlers for a moment. Um, we do need to dehumidify. So we're gonna bring that, whatever the air handling supplier, it's gotta come down to 55 to bring out the moisture and then we have to bring the temperature back up. So what's our method? Uh, one method is the least energy efficient, the brute force, let's use a reheat coil, and this works, right? Um, we can use, often use, the return air bypass. So we're gonna bring, our return air temperature in these examples is gonna be warmer than typical. It's not gonna be at the same temperature of the space. It may be 80, 90 degrees. So a little bit of bypass air can bring the temperature from 55 up to whatever our desired is, control it exactly with some dampers. If the application has a DX system and the manufacturer is capable of using hot gas reheat, there you go. Another uh, method that's generally free. Um, and finally, as we're considering our economizer use, this is an economizer controller, we wanna make sure that we're using, um, we're looking at enthalpy because there are gonna be many days where we can use free cooling up into the 60 degrees, but we also wanna make sure that we're not bringing too much humidity into the space. So moving ahead, we're gonna go through a design example. This is a one that is being designed now. It's UWM's Klotchke Center. I think I'm pronouncing that right. And it is a very unique space with, um, a wide variety of different rooms, and we're gonna take a look at each of those and decide, oh, is this an opportunity for displacement or no? There is a film room, a gym, uh, a lounge, a uh, weight room, and then a single office. So pretty wide variety of spaces in one of each. So um, here's the overall plan. And what's very interesting is, so we've got this lounge that has, it's a, Skywalk, because there's a road underneath it. There's a training center here, I'm sorry, a film room, which is densely packed. Um, we have a gymnasium, but unlike a typical gymnasium, which has like commencement events and whatnot, there's only 40 people uh, for this space. And then we have a trainer's room over here. All right, so let's look at each of these individual spaces and decide displacement, or not? Can we do it? So here's the film room. Now, based on the cuts that we've seen, it kind of, it kind of to me looks like this is a tiered floor, based on how close these folks are and the position of um, where the film would be run. I suspect it's a tiered floor. Now, if we are able to, what'd be great would be to seal up this floor and make it a floor plenum. In the event that it's a floor plenum, a round um, underfloor displacement diffuser can be used. If um, it doesn't lend itself well to displacement diffusers, we have other diffusers that are floor, in other words, a displacement diffuser in the floor that you can walk on that look like a linear bar grill. Or if we can't, don't have a raised floor, we could put diffusers here along the wall where people would be stepping up to the back row. So in the event, that this space has tiered seating, 
we definitely don't want to put one diffuser here um, and allow the expect the diffuser to walk or ex expect the displacement error to walk up the steps. We definitely want to cascade down. Will it do it? It will. Will it do it as effectively? It will not. I mean, if you put a heat source next to displacement error, it won't fall to the floor and rise up. The displacement error will actually move horizontally. So it's actually pretty interesting when we play around in the lab. So a quick word about floor diffusers. We all have an impression about what an office floor diffuser, how it behaves. This next video will show you that a displaced floor displacement diffuser is very different from what the traditional floor diffusers um, flow patterns are. With an airflow of 50 CFM, the ARFHD round floor diffuser produces a low velocity horizontal swirl pattern, which remains tight to the floor as it displaces room air. The low velocity air mixes slowly with room air, rising as the heat load from people and equipment is absorbed. Now, if those diffusers were applied in this zone, you could put an eight inch diffuser between every two occupants. So what's involved in the labor? You, someone cuts the hole, we take the diffuser, and with the um, press fit gasket, we step on the diffuser and we walk away. So talk about a nice uh, opportunity for labor savings for the mechanical contractor. All right, so we saw the video. Uh, what about the gym? So the gym's, the gym's got some interesting challenges. Um, normally, what would happen is we'd have round diffusers and try to mix up this entire space. Dave, maybe you know how tall it is, but it's, it's gym height, so it's at least 25 feet. Um, considering the span of the gym, and all gyms, 75 feet, if we were going to bring displacement air down to the floor, uh, we would want it on both sides because 75 foot 8, um, Price might wrinkle their nose a little bit about covering that span with diffusers only on one side. So we're going to have to bring the air down, split it, diffusers down. Well, we don't need to do that because as we've talked, um, it doesn't matter where you hold the hose and displacement systems. So we can take this DR360 or any other frankly, displacement diffuser, mount it above the ceiling and allow that cooler air to fall to the floor, making use of buoyancy. And also, we're not going to be bringing a return down to the floor because we also know that that doesn't make a difference. So we'll have a high return, high supply, and our air handlers up on the second floor. So we're not going to increase our duct work at all for this application, which is cool. So wait a minute, Tom, hang on. If you're doing cooling with displacement air, that's not necessarily gonna work when, what about Christmas break? You know, nobody's gonna be in the gym and uh, you can't heat with displacement. Well, so we have a little bit of a workaround here. So if we look at these flow patterns, hey Dave, you keeping an eye on the chat stuff? Yep, I am. We got a couple okay. coming up here. Okay, if, any, if you need to interject any of them, fire away. Gotcha. So, so when we're cooling, air is falling to the floor. Between zero degrees and five degrees, we have this sort of isothermal effect where we can actually do some heating. Well, would that work in a gym if the diffuser is 20 feet off the floor? No. Then finally, if we put five degrees higher temperature than the space, the air will go straight up. Well, most gyms end up with destratification fans anyways. So there would be nothing wrong with heating with the displacement diffuser, air rises to the ceilings, and then we're going to use some of these various air pair fans to direct that heated air back to the floors, preferably on the perimeter where our load's coming from, as opposed to putting in a bunch of radiant heat. So, all right. Hey, Tom, one, one question on the gym that was asked is, could a fabric duct be used as a displacement diffuser in the gym? It can. It can. Yes. Um, not any, just any old fabric duct, but it's possible. And we've done a little bit of that too. Okay. Now, let's talk about this lounge. So we've got um, an interesting space where we've got um, heating and cooling applied to all four sides. We don't have any interior zones. We're exterior on everything, the top, the bottom, and the two sides. So since we know that displacement is cooling and ventilating only, um, well, we did use an example of heating with it, but um, in this space, we're going to want to use perimeter heat to match the heating load. Um, um, yeah, we want to match the envelope load, sorry. 
So in the event that we have a heat recovery chiller or a very high efficient boiler, we're going to want to use panel radiators. I think this is Runtel, uh, Byron sells that, and there's Rittling too. Um, if the temperature is higher, we're going to use standard baseboard, or we're going to use radiant ceiling panels. And the radiant ceiling panels kind of fall off at 140, but above that they'll work pretty well. Um, just the lower the temperature, the more square footage of panel you need. So we will ventilate and cool with displacement air, and then we'll match the heating requirements with uh, the perimeter. All right, next space, strength and conditioning. Who's been to a stinky gym before? All of us probably, and if you haven't been to the gym, you should get to the gym. But um, displacement in a gym is a perfect application, mostly for creature comfort, but there's also, we've got a bunch of, you know, if the basketball team's in there and they're pumping iron, the women or the men, they're gonna put out a lot of heat. So one thing we wanna consider um, is if we're doing perimeter heating, we may want to uh, put that on the stat as opposed to pairing it with the um, outside air reset, just in case it gets hot in there. Um, but yeah, this is a perfect application for a gym. I wish the gyms that I go to uh, would use it because a couple of smelly dudes in there, no good. Uh, and finally, this training room, there's a lot of different ways to do a small space. In the upper right-hand corner, we're showing uh, a heating, cooling changeover diffuser. Uh, this is a picture of it. So when it's cooling, air is coming through the face of the displacement diffuser, but we know that we can't accomplish anything if it's heating. So it has an internal stat, and the actuator switches to the slot and will heat the envelope until the space is at temperature, and then we'll move back to displacement. So it's an automatic heating, cooling, changeover diffuser. Another method is a cabinet with the displacement on the bottom. Ideally, this would be bottom feed. Displacement comes out of the face. And then we have an integral cabinet with, which can house a, um, a fin tube heat. So another way to go, we've applied this, it's come out really nice. All right. So I'm gonna turn this part over to Dave, and Dave, I'll keep driving for you, but Dave's just gonna talk about um, the loads, looking at the loads uh, for each of these spaces and put a little commentary. Yeah, thanks, Tom. So we're just gonna run through a little bit of the each room by room and what the load calcs look like and what we're gonna pull from in order to enter into the program. Um, a lot of you have seen the trace load uh, room calc, which is shown on the right. Um, a couple of the things that we're going to need to plug into the program that we need to keep an eye on is the number of people. And in the film room, you can see the number of people. It's a, it's a highly densely populated room at 40 for 1,500 square feet. And our load, just for the people alone, is about two-thirds or over half of what the actual load is in the space. This makes the, a DV system in here extremely effective. In the gym, as Tom had mentioned, it's a little bit more of a challenge. Um, traditional gyms, you'd have some bleachers on the side and you'd have a larger number of occupants than 40. In this case, the gym is strictly used for training and practice purposes. So it is only the team that's in there and any opposing players that they bring in to scrimmage or practice against. So in this case, we still have to cover the QEX load, which is our exterior load, which Tom's highlighted there in the middle. And you can see where a lot of that roof conductance, glass solar, uh, that has to still be covered by the displacement ventilation system. Um, the tonnage in this is not significantly high at 30 tons, but the uh, square footage for the space and the exterior load having lots of glass is going to drive that. Our CFM isn't going to be able to be reduced quite as much as we'd like to see here. And Tom will run through, us, run through that with us when we get to the uh, reports. The lobby, a uh, very unique space again. It's exposed on all four sides. It's basically a catwalk over a main drive. Uh, they're going to use it as a pre-event lounge area. So the density of people is 32. Our loads are not all that ridiculous for that kind of space, having glass on both sides and exposed top and bottom at uh, six tons. But in an instance like this with glass and people right up against it, I think Tom's suggestion of some type of radiant heat to cover some of that envelope load would be beneficial. Strength and conditioning, 
Uh, always a challenge to make sure we keep the odors out of there and keep enough air moving through there. Uh, they've got a relatively decent density at 18 people and a, a small load at five tons. Um, based on what we have for the envelope loads, probably not a lot of glass, um, minimal glass. They have some solar conductance gain through the wall, but nothing drastic in this space. Displacement ventilation in a corner or overhead in here would work out great. The training room, uh, very small, 480 square feet. Um, the way that they have it shown right now from the architect is probably just a depiction of what might be there. With six people in the space, my guess is you're probably going to have two trainers and possibly two players in there getting taped up or worked on, and then probably an additional one or two that are in there getting, you know, working at the desk or taking care of some, some other items. In a small space like this, like Tom mentioned, the challenge is going to be where you place that overhead diffuser and the type of um, either corner or sidewall DV grill that you use in order to prevent the um, air from dropping right on top of somebody. Cool. I think that's it. Dave, thank you. <laughs> nice to be able to take a break in the middle. <laughs> hey, so um, so this software that, that we're talking about, uh, it's available on Price's website. So if you go into the, go into the homepage and you hit resources and software, You'll find at the bottom of this list, the room designer, and then you'll get this screen and be able to download the software. And all that sounds great. I'm sure your IT department is really thrilled to have another software package on your desk. But this is what the software looks like. Now notice, um, we've got um, a designation for an air handler and then rooms below it. And we've got these air handler properties and some of the things you saw like the um, load of the lights and the load of the exterior and the load total and all this kind of stuff. Well, you can fill all this in manually if you like, um, but what we're going to show you next is just as quick how to most everybody, not most everybody, many of you use Train Trace. So we have an automatic import function from Train Trace. Um, so pretty easy. Um, you find that reporting page, go to import from Trace. And you got to dig up your project data and we want project data that's going to be both the room files and the load files and then voila um, we've got all the, the full air handler and the rooms into the dv format so it's going to automatically fill in those values for you and give you your new displacement um, value for to match the load now why is this important well it does seem like displacement is often an afterthought. So an engineer may say, all right, well, I got to at least figure out how big my mechanical room is. So they'll get, a, get some basic loads and then they'll go ahead and say, all right, well, I'm going to need this much air and boom, they figure out the air handler. But if you have these basic loads and you can quickly turn them into displacement loads, you may find that you can cut your air handler by 10 or 20%. So if you're able to cut your air handler by 10 or 20 percent, then hey, displacement should definitely be on the table. That's in addition to the safety and the comfort features that the, this application has. So that's part of the reason why we want to show it. It's, it's oh man, I, I can't really, I don't have the energy to put all my loads in and then do another displacement calc. And you have to be careful because um, not all the displacement software in load calcs do it right. Um, we've dug into what Train Trace does in the past. They don't necessarily apply ASH rate formulas. So it's a good idea to use this tool just to make sure. And if you design around price, generally we're not generally, we're going to stand behind the project. Okay. Oops. So now what we're going to look at is the side by side comparison of the two systems. So here we have the film room, and this is a snip of the load calc that demonstrates that we need 941 CFM for that 1500 square foot room. And then now let's take a look here. 15, we've carried over the square foot, we've carried over the height, we've carried over our loads, the set point, the number of occupants, the air change rate. One thing that's off, uh, the program doesn't know that Wisconsin uh, requires only seven and a half CFM per square foot. I imagine that uh, Wisconsin government is thinking about maybe changing that considering what's going on with 
our pandemic. Um, but notice that we're at 918 CFM versus 941. So it's a very modest airflow reduction, but the ventilation effectiveness is superior. And that will be the case for all these examples about ventilation effectiveness. The gym, 32 feet tall, I was wrong about 25, 40 occupants. We're dropping from 12,200 down to 11,570. That's a 6% airflow reduction. Again, better ventilation effectiveness. Okay, so we're not increasing the size of our air handler. We're not gr drastically reducing it. Consider this. If this space had many, many occupants, like a typical gym would, bleachers, um, commencement kind of stuff, the reduction would go up pretty significantly. Okay, uh, we talked about overhead displacement ventilation, and one of the services that Price does offer is CFD analysis. So here's the CFD analysis of an overhead displacement system. These white marks are the overhead displacement diffusers. And you can, now it's not exactly completely intuitive because there's a lot of colors here, but uh, green would be our comfortable zone. And even though we're dropping our cool air from above, generally everywhere we go, we're very comfortable. And notice how we've stratified the heat at the peak and the difference in temperature. So from 75, whatever the occupied space temperature is, all the way up to 85. Normally our return would be the same temperature as the room. So any space, just about, can be, um, instead of mocking it up, can be drawn and put together in CFD. What's great about Price's CFD is they actually model the diffusers against what's in the CFD program to make sure that they actually match, as opposed to if someone buys a CFD program and says, I'm putting a diffuser in, well, they're not gonna have those same models, and particularly not in displacement ventilation. Okay. And moving on. The lobby, 14% airflow reduction. We went from 1916 to under 1700. Great, good application. The strength and conditioning room, not as much reduction as you might think. Um, I would have thought this would be far greater. Um, and finally, um, the training room, 22% air, airflow reduction. Now, when would that come into place? Well, this is not much different than a conference room. So if you have similar spaces that are smallish with um, higher density, not necessarily the same as a film room, the airflow reduction can be pretty appreciable. If the whole project were 22%, which happens, well, all of a sudden you're talking about a completely different air handling system. We just recently went through a large office building and applied displacement, and we did reduce the air handlers by over 20% using displacement compared to mixing. All right. So now what's nice about the program, it's giving us a total airflow. So this system drops from 17,300 or something like that down to 16,000. So about 7% redu reduction in airflow, which is great. So what does that mean? Well, a couple of side-by-sides. Um, for you sports fans who don't know, airflow is taking on Dun & Bush is our air handler and chiller manufacturer. More on that in the future. But here's, our, and these are drawings we generated from their software. Um, here's our standard AHU for VAV. We've got return fan, mixing box, filter, coils are reversed, should be heating and cooling, another fan and a final filter. So by adding a bypass section, we're gonna make the unit a little bit longer. So hopefully the mechanical room can, can accommodate. Um, but we're also, in this case, 7% smaller. Maybe we can drop a cabinet size. If we're concerned about the height, we can bypass around the side. If we're concerned about the width, we can bypass over the top. Okay. So system summary here. Um, airflow, bigger, smaller cost, maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit bigger unless we're able to drop a cabinet size. 7% for displacement is fairly modest in airflow reduction. Um, so um, we didn't have a lot of tall spaces and in the gym we didn't have a big occupant density, but it's worth it to look. Um, we're gonna lower the operating cost. We're gonna have a similar first cost on the air. Uh, in the film room, if the floor is raised 
and we can just make sure that plenum is sealed. We have almost no cost for HVAC. We drop a return grill in and cut some holes and off we go. In the gymnasium, if there isn't a low return, which why would you put in a low return anymore? Um, lower ducting cost for sure. And you could make the debate that um, we need de-stratification fans to do our morning warm up. But you would be in a mixing system, we're gonna have buoyancy effects and stratification with any diffuser system. So you should have de-strat fans either way. Uh, lobby, be great because we're coming from, basically coming across with utilities, be an ideal raised floor or ducted underfloor system. Raised floor forces us to build a plenum, but you can also put in a handful of uh, wall diffusers ducted from underneath, so that would be good. Um, strength and conditioning, because of the air handler on the second floor, this would be a great uh, overhead DV application. And finally, in the training room, there's a lot of different ways to skin that cat. Hey, Tom. Yeah. What, one question is how, just in a quick nutshell, how does the, how does DV, just in a quick purest form, how does DV reduce the CFM for an air handler? How does DV, re oh, okay. Well, if we scroll back to that page where we're displacing all those loads, um, we just, we're only cooling the occupied zone. So everything that's over my head, do we really care what's going on up there? It can be as hot as we want. We've all walked up in the attic, right? We go up in the attic, it's like, oh my God, it's so hot up here. Well, who cares what's going on up there unless we're, we're going up there? In an office building that's 10 feet, who cares about the first four feet? Unless Shaq's working in your office, the top four feet is unoccupied. It's just plenum space. So we're not worried about conditioning that plenum. In a mixing system, the taller the space is, you have to process the entire load. We are displacing <clears throat> the load. Does that help? Yep, yeah, kind of. So we're not, we're not fighting the de-stratification itself. We're letting it happen. Right, right. Just letting Mother Nature work its business. Um, one more slide is, uh, I didn't see Mike Kuprianov here. He was registered, but I don't think he was able to make it. If you're there, Mike, uh, yeah. He's on, he's on, oh, Tom. Mike, I'm you here. on? Yeah, I'm here. All right. Hey, Mike. Um, so I talked briefly uh, in a slide about um, CFD, but would you um, do your, Mike and I have worked together on a few projects. It's, it's really fun to have a, a CFD whiz to say, uh, yeah, you might not want to do that, but this might work. Um, so Mike runs the CFD department for Price, and they, for the first time, are making their services available to consulting engineers. And maybe you could talk a little bit about how that process works and then also the research that you've got cooking back in the factory. Yeah, yeah, thanks, thanks, Tom. So I, I guess the idea behind the service is when it's, I guess, uh, you know, maybe like a larger space, for example, something that's not as easy to design with hand calculation. Uh, this is a great way to kind of verify some of those calculations. Um, especially the ones that come from those equations. And in a lot of cases for bigger spaces, you'll actually get uh, bigger airflow savings than you see in those calculations. And kind of the way Tom showed it, I, I like that, Tom, that you were showing that load per square foot because it kind of shows that that's one of the driving factors that if you're kind of have more load density, you can actually get away with less air using displacement uh, ventilation. Um, and the other nice thing is you guys have seen all the nice videos that, uh, we're taking in our lab. So the nice thing about being part of price is that we can validate the CFD um, against the data that we take in the lab. Um, and we've done just that for different types of diffusers, uh, definitely a lot for displacement and uh, underfloor as well, because they tend to be typically a bit harder to implement. Um, and then as far as testing and COVID, uh, we're in the process. I think we're almost done the planning. We're actually assembling the test chamber to get it ready for it. Uh, we're going to be doing quite a bit of aerosol testing with different types of air systems. So basically we'll have like a little nebulizer that generates airborne particles similar to what a person might breathe out or talk out or cough out or whatever. Um, and we're going to do actual measurements with particle counters and all that. Um, to see kind of the impacts of different designs and different systems. So there's going to be kind of a phased approach 
So the research is going to take a fair bit of time. Um, and the first phase, we kind of like to think of it, that's like the basic science, you know, just to see what happens in a typical mixing system, see what happens uh, with displacement and do a fair amount of detail um, in those measurements. And then the other thing, I guess, tying back to CFD, we can then make sure that the CFD model, which can also do particle tracking, um, if that's something that interests anybody, uh, we're going to use that as a way to validate that as well. So that, that's kind of the research effort that we're undertaking right now. And we're, we're actually really close to starting some of the preliminary testing um, as well. We've got the instruments, the test room, we're just kind of uh, finishing building it up. And then we have to do some kind of some preliminary benchmarking with our instruments and our particle generator just to make sure they kind of do what we think that they're going to do. Right. So if you have an application, I mean, one of the goals of using price for CFD is to, number one, eliminate some of your risk because nobody likes field work after the contract's been written. That's number one. Let's make sure it's going to work. And in many cases, not all, but many cases, sometimes you're able to um, downsize some equipment because the ventilation effectiveness is an improvement or the load distribution is, is an improvement or a, we're worried about condensation on the windows, so we're going to put extra double heat in this space, that kind of stuff. We can, you can rule those types of things in or out, depending on the specifics of a project. So um, if you want to engage with uh, price on CFD, it's just, you know, send me a note and um, we can set up a Zoom call similar to this and we can show you a similar example, something like that. So Mike, thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks for giving me a chance to speak, Tom. You bet. Um, so what do we cover today? Uh, can you do it yourself? You can. We can all, we're also happy to help you. But what, what's the upside of at least considering DV on the front end of a project? Uh, safety, comfort, air quality, and energy for sure. Uh, most of the people who've done a displacement project find a great deal of satisfaction having done it. Um, having done something a little bit differently, and uh, the owners tend to rave about it. Um, if, um, so hopefully this is enough to motivate you, but if you need just a little bit more prompting, and it's, we're not bringing folks to price these days, but hopefully that will happen in the future. But for one last little bit of motivation, you can see some beautiful spaces where it's been installed. So on the left, that's uh, Potawatomi, Bingo, and Casino, both those gaming floors have been retrofitted. They are all, not all, almost all overhead. Um, there's a lower ceiling space that's been retrofitted with low diffusers. We recently retrofitted the high roller area. So if you're a high roller, hey, um, got to make it nice for the high rollers. The one in the middle is the Basilica of St. Joseph at, which is actually I've never been to. But that was a very difficult space to add air conditioning to. And instead of building a sheet metal plenum, um, we built, or a drywall plenum was built and we applied displacement diffusers to that in the floor. On the right is St. Catharines in Racine. And you probably can't figure out where the displacement diffusers are, but we, we were able to put them in mid-level. We we're also able to curve them. so. It really came out beautifully. And in that space, because of the density, because of the glass on the other side, which you're not seeing, we still were able to reduce that airflow by, I think, 22%. I don't remember exactly. And finally, this um, lower picture is um, University School Dining Room. And that was, where, that was an application where we wanted DV, but we also had a lot of perimeter. And there was an issue about how it looked, so we used that a displacement diffuser with the integrated heating element on the top. And um, we've done lots more than these, but these are the best pictures I have. So um, yeah, join the club. It's a very, it's not as big a club as it should be, um, but um, there's more displacement projects out there, number one, and there's way more to be had. And uh, if there ever was a time to start looking more closely at DV, I would think it would be now based on all those benefits. So, hey Dave, um, yeah, we, we got what's one our that question came in. file look like? Uh, does the price DF1L 
HC yes. have a heat source like a VAV box or is it just a damper actuator? So let's say that we were using a packaged rooftop unit, okay? So packaged rooftop unit with hot gas reheat and it may, it probably has a, a, a furnace section too. So for morning warm up, for example, you know, starting at five in the morning, we would run heat through it. Well, putting heat through a displacement diffuser is only gonna warm the ceiling tiles for us. So that would be what we'd use on the perimeter and the interior zones would be just straight displacement diffusers for ventilating and cooling. You can, you can do DV with a VAV system as well, or it's very well. You can also do it with a VAV system, yes, yes. What else uh, is hiding in there? That's pretty much it. We answered quite a bit of them as we went along. Um, a couple of them were, were revolving the air handler, what makes the air handler CFM a little bit less and how we att attack that. Um, a couple people will want to look at some pricing from Mike on the CFB and kind of get an idea of what that looks like in order of magnitude. Good. Good. All right. Well, of course, so as far as, you know, downloading the software and applying it, I would definitely, you know, engage with Dave for sure or me if you want to walk through an example because it's easy in the first, you know, the first couple go arounds to get a little bit frustrated, but uh, for the most part, uh, one of the questions we had yesterday was, well, you know, which diffuser should I pick? And, you know, where should I put them? And I don't know what the architect's going to say. You, because, you know, going back to that hose example, it doesn't really matter where you place the diffuser. So what, let's say a zone needs 4,000 CFM. Well, we're designing around 40 feet per minute off of the face. Maybe less, maybe more, but that's a good starting spot. You take your airflow and divide by 40, and that's how much square feet of diffuser you need. Does it matter if it's round or flat or in the ceiling or in the floor? No. You just got to find, in this case, 100 feet of diffuser. So hopefully that helps as a starting place. And then you can engage with your architect and say, well, I'm not smart enough to hide 100 feet of diffuser, but maybe you can. <laughs> They'll be like, oh, that's right up my alley, Mr. HVAC guy. Anybody else? Fire away, please. We got like two minutes left, so um, we'll hang out for a minute if you have a question. And if not, oh, I forgot to mention, this is the PDH class. It, we didn't announce it that way because initially it was more um, nuts and bolts, how to convert from train trace to DV calc tool. Uh, but because we went and covered more fundamentals, we're going to issue everybody who attended the whole time a PDH certificate. So it's bonus time here at the Airflow Zoom call. And if not, thanks very much for attending. We appreciate your time and look forward to working on one of these with you.